Sean O'Connor and I started our friendship in one of the more unique ways of my life. He was actually the first person I didn't already know to make a purchase through the Standard H online shop. As a result, a thank you note was sent followed by subsequent DMs through Instagram, which led us to meeting up for a surf session in Malibu, and well, the rest is history. As I've gotten to know Sean over the years, I can't help but be more and more impressed by him and his accomplishments. As the founder, owner, and operator of Venice, California-based Sean O'Connor Lighting, he's taken part in some of the most recognizable buildings in the Los Angeles area. He worked on the offices of United Talent Agency, as well as the Waldorf Astoria and Beverly Hills. He's currently doing the outdoor space surrounding the new arena in San Francisco for the Golden State Warriors, and has completed projects for retail environments as well as art museums. His projects have stretched outside of the United States, ranging from Europe all the way to Asia. He and his team's talents awarded them incredible recognition while being named among the top three lighting companies in the world. We talk about creativity, surfing with sharks, living in a Frank Gehry duplex, and of course a bit of watch talk ensues. Needless to say, I felt sitting down with Sean would make for a great chat, so I hope you agree. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. So Sean, thank you for having me and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Wesley. Good to be here. Um, just to jump off real quick, what, uh, what area did you grow up in? I grew up in a sleepy little town called Seal Beach here in California. It's, um, it's a cute beach town. It's north Orange County. It's north of Huntington Beach, sort of uh, referred to as Mayberry by the Sea. And I think we say that because there's no chain stores, no chain restaurants. So it's just sort of like mom and pop shops with a grocery store you'd recognize. Yeah. Interesting being from North Carolina because Mayberry is North Carolina based. Is it really? Yeah. Okay, that's funny. The Andy Griffith show, right? Sure. Yeah, I just yeah, didn't yeah. know that was North Carolina. Yeah, I think they filmed it outside of like, or just north of Winston-Salem, I think. Interesting. Um, but anyway, that's funny that they call it that. Is there a military base, right? Nearby? There's a military base there, Naval Weapons. No affiliation with that, with your family? What did your parents um, do? So my, my father, um, before he retired, was a aerospace engineer. So he worked on all kinds of cool things through the 70s and 80s, from satellites to airplanes and all kinds of stuff, all for the government but as a contractor. But he was in the military um, prior to that, and he was um, actually at the La Salle Air Base, which is right next to Seal Beach. Okay. Seal Beach and Los Alamitos are actually neighbors. Um, I actually grew up in Los Alamitos or Los Alamitos, and then there is the air base behind that that's actually kind of attached to the Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station. Cool. And mom? My mom was a realtor um, for my childhood and then later on ended up working for uh, my high school. Oh, cool. In like an administration? administration? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. So I went to a high school for the arts and that was sort of a, a new thing in Orange County at the time. I sort of founded that in 1988. So I was like the second graduating class or third graduating class from that school. So was that all types of art was it music as well yeah it was music um in the form of like musical theater later on they did have like actual like music if you want to be in a band kind of a thing and then there's um all kinds of dance you know classical dance ballet modern that kind of thing and then um there was visual arts which is what i what i was doing and then there was also um um uh, technical theater what they called it at the time which was like you know set design writing right. behind the scenes stuff yeah all the behind the scenes stuff so visually like what were you into was it painting drawing everything it was kind of everything my, my grandmother my dad's mom the sort of the creative side of my family um was a painter and so i began oil painting with her when i was six years old oh wow um you know i think the first paintings i look back at them i definitely feel like you know she's painting or holding my hand and painting because i don't recognize the hand as being mine so much um but over time it became more me and i was usually just when i would spend my weekends with them and she would show me how to paint or teach me to paint i would basically duplicate a painting she had already made previously and they were all like landscapes and sort of these you know, good old days kind of, yeah. you know, scenes. That's awesome. And well, now you can pay to do that. You just drink wine while you do it. 
it's a different world for sure. <laughs> you know, when I was five and six, that wasn't happening. At least I didn't know about it if it was. So yeah, so I sort of, um, I guess that sort of means I, I came from a sort of creative family and tried to, to follow through with that, you know, in my, my different endeavors. That's cool. What, where, now, where did your grandparents live? Were they close by? Um, my grandparents were in Lakewood, California, so okay, that's right so. next to Long Beach. Yeah, not too far. Not too far. So then you graduate from art school and then college? College, um, I did do that. I went to, um, <laughs> I did a, a short stint at Long Beach City College after sort of a, a failed attempt to go to school in New York. And then um, from there, um, found my way. I'd always been passionate about architecture and design, and I thought I was going to go to school for graphic design originally. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at City College, I sort of found my way to interiors and architecture, which I'd always really been excited about as a, as a kid. And like I had like every, every weekend or every afternoon I had free time, I'd play with my Legos or my Lincoln Logs or Tinker Toys or yeah. a Rector set or you name it, anything you'd make things. And my friend Glenn across the street, his dad had this great wood shop in the garage. So we were always making things. And so I was really interested in making things and but um, was intimidated by the math requirement of architecture. Sure. Um, because I was never really strong at like algebra or trigonometry, calculus, those things always freaked me out. Right. Um, and then so I, but anyway, so with, in, in City College, the architecture program was really more about just design and you were sort of free of the math requirement. And I was like, ah, I think I'm going to do architecture. I think this is really what, what it's meant to be. And my grandmother, my mom's mom, always wanted me to be an architect, I guess, because she saw the things I was playing with. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Anyway, so fast forward, I found an architecture school here in Los Angeles. It was a more creative architecture school that didn't have all the rigor of prerequisites and things, um, or just differently so. It was called SciArc. It's sort of an independent architecture school. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah they, don't have, they have no other majors. It's all architecture. Now, so where, a, where is that? Where is that school? Today, it's in downtown Los Angeles, okay, yeah. but um, when I was there... It was just like a mile from where we're sitting today. So it was in sort of this sort of western Culver City, now called Playa Vista. Yeah, I was thinking area. it was near the, the airport. Not too far. It's off of, it was off of Jefferson. Got so it. So really the next major street south of us. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so any particular architects that jumped out at you or toward at the time? You know, as far as inspiration or... Well, it's sort of interesting. So I used to, you know, I still do buy a lot of books and look at a lot of books. And so I was working, um, spent some time at the Rizzoli bookstore and I, I just look at architecture books and it was a lot of the contemporary stuff is what stood out, what was happening in, in LA in the late eighties and early nineties. And that was sort of that sort of sci -arc school of architects, whether it's Frank Gehry, Eric Owen Moss, Morphosis, all these different firms and so that was what was interesting and exciting to me because I hadn't seen anything like that it was just different than the house I grew up in or different in the buildings that I saw or my dad worked in or whatever yeah for sure and so it was a much more artistic idea of of architecture and I was like well hey I can I can do that um, I think or that makes it more interesting than you know building a tract house or whatever a, right. a normal path might lead you to today um, so yeah, that was sort of what, what school looked like for me. I did a couple of years at, at SciArc, then I transferred to a school in San Francisco, and then... And then left school and did I what? I did. I left what, school. What were some of your first jobs? Well, I left... So sort of during school or between school stints, I worked for um, a retailer called Barney's New York. Sure. And they were in the process of expanding um, their footprint across the U.S. They were originally a New York store, and they... Opened here at Costa Mesa, which is where I first started working for them. And then through that, uh, began going to different store openings in different cities. And then ultimately, um, you know, opened the Madison Avenue store in New York, then came back and opened the Beverly Hills store. And then shortly after that, kind of petered out um, with that and decided to go back to school, actually. So I sort of did take a break. Um, but there I learned so much and even more than I ever learned in school about design and we had amazing architects that we worked with. Peter Marino was was the architect at Barney's for most of the stores. Yeah, absolutely. And He's a major in fashion, for sure. Major in fashion world. Barney's was a sort of first fashion client. Um, 
he was like a different character then. Like now he's all in leather, but there back then he was a three piece suit guy. Oh no way! way I can't even picture his New York that. accent. Yeah, so it's just a completely different idea of of what it was then. But I learned so much from him. He's so incredibly talented, and the way he talks and thinks was was really amazing. And and I was sort of like a fly on the wall, I guess, for some of that. Um, and that was really cool. And then. From there, um, because we were building these stores, we worked with a lighting consultant also, segue. Right, And <laughs> um, sure. And that was really interesting to me, and I learned a lot from them, and, and the one partner in that firm kind of took me under his wing, at least I think so, um, and maybe he doesn't realize it, but I learned a lot from him. And then after my Barney's time, I went and worked for a firm that did both architecture and lighting design, and then kind of got the bug and stuck with it and that was the early 90s so you were in sales for barney's no i worked in um the display department so oh, visual okay. merchandising, like merchandising display store design those, those sorts of pieces yeah. got it now where was the architecture firm that you or the architecture and lighting firm was that oh, that was in, in san LA? francisco oh so in no, san francisco. after i sort of bounced around and found my way to san francisco yeah yeah do you i mean to this day do you have a favorite city because i mean it sounds like new york la san francisco um, I mean, I, obviously you live here. I do right? live here so. f- for a reason. Um, I think, <laughs> I think this is my favorite city. Uh, it's, you know, it's close to home, close to my heart. I spent most of my life here. Hard to say that now because I've been everywhere. Um, surfing's better here. Surfing is better here. Well, more consistent at and least. warmer. Yeah. Um, but no, so I think it's, it's been good. I like LA. I love New York too, which we have a place there too. My wife, um, was there for a long time before we met. So we still have her place there. Um, and New York is great because it's full of energy and inspiration. And but I'm also good to be there for three or four days and then come back. Sure. And I'm there a lot for work anyway. So um, I guess I have that luxury of sort of being in a lot of places. I don't get to see all the things that everybody else does because I'm usually there for a meeting or something. But right. having a home in New York makes it easier to be there and certainly spend more time there. So, what was? Um... What was that transition like working for other firms and now obviously you own your own business? What was that timeline and like what was that transition like? Well, that's a funny one. I, I, I honestly don't ever feel like I had enough time working for other people because um, this just sort of happened one day. I was a baby. I was like 25 years old. I had no business doing this on my own. I really didn't know enough um, to run a business per se. I I think that I have a certain understanding of things and a little bit of talent that, that was got me there. And from the firm I worked for in San Francisco, later on clients that we had worked with kind of came in and found me after I had moved away. And so that's kind of how I ended up in business. If it was meant to be business, it was just sort of felt like a freelance job at first. And then it just kind of steamrolled into to this that was 21 years ago so i was 25 I mean, so were you sending out proposals or like were you just they literally just found you like what happened to sean <laughs> it was a little bit what happened to sean i mean I, I i left san francisco with a project a freelance project that then became two then became three and then so just on domino effect sort of dominoed and i and I, and I learned a lot on other people's dimes you know but i think at the same time that i didn't charge much to do it. I was just happy to do it. And I was excited, um, to be doing it. I was working from home and didn't require a lot. And I had no idea what fees were, you know, because I never had access to that because I was so young. And I actually ended up after working for architecture and light, I went back on the client side again, I worked for gap. And so, you know, I just didn't have the visibility to, to the business end of it at all. So did that take you back to San Francisco then? That's when I was in San Francisco. Yeah. 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 So, um, is kind of we'll jump around here obviously sure. but like with with regards to pricing you, you you bring this up i think it's a really interesting conversation to have like how do you go about charging customers like how do you find your rates i mean obviously supply and demand enter the picture maybe later hmm. uh given that i only have a fixed amount of time and and so i can't have a hundred thousand you know clients so i must charge more right but what early days like how how did you think about pricing well, again, I, I didn't, I didn't have a cost. I didn't know what things cost to do. I was just like, oh, if I could, you know, pay the rent and I could eat and do the the simple things, then I thought I was covered. So if I charged, you know, three thousand dollars to design a store, I thought I was doing good. 
and I would travel to that store at the end and adjust the lights and do all those sorts of things. Full service. Which, yeah. Which, you know, today we, we couldn't sustain $3,000 to do either one of those parts of it, you know? And <laughs> right. so, um, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And, and I loved what I did and that was sort of what mattered and I was able to pay the bills, so to speak. And so life was good. Sure. Um, I guess we, we completely glazed over this, but can you describe what it is that you do? <laughs> uh, sure. So what I, what, I, what, I, what I do seems really familiar to me, but it's not familiar to most people. So here in, in, in my firm, Sean O'Connor Lighting, we are uh, an architectural lighting design firm. And what that means is that we design lighting for space in the same way that architects or interior designers design what they do, which is to say that we're... Um, providing the light for those spaces. It's not to say that we're designing chandeliers or, or physical lights. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we are doing the architectural lights. So think, so you think about it as recess lights or shelf lights or any of those kinds of things. Um, it's more complicated than that. That sort of is the, is the easy way to look at it, but that's our sole business is just designing lighting for a fee independent of any sales. So we don't sell anything. We don't make any commissions for product. It's all about sort of an independent, expert working on lighting so hotels retail stores homes um high-end office projects just looking around to see other examples i kind of forget sometimes all the categories because I, I, look, I looked up from my desk that's the last thing i was doing um, but that's what we do so you kind of design the aura of the space if you will I not i mean right. that might be a little more holistic but I think that at, at a certain point that is that is true. I think what we do is we have to take a lot of visual information from an architect or an interior designer or other consultants, it could be a landscape architect, and sort of understand the big idea of the space and then use light to sort of lead the eye or lead a person through the space and tell a story right. and then create an emotion. Sure. And those are completely different emotions. So sitting here in our conference room is sort of one idea of what it might feel like. I can push a button over there and give you a different atmosphere for this space for doing something different than having this conversation. And the same is sort of true. You think about restaurants. So we do a lot of hotel work. There's always restaurants. So what the restaurant feels like during the day versus at night or late night, it's all very different. And that's all done through the lighting. So how does one do that? Right. Mm. Like, I mean, that's kind of the secret sauce, I'm sure. But like, you know, in photography, you have reflectors and things like that and, and things that can assist you mm. in creating an image, be it. I mean, you can use a different reflector for uh, a cooler tone or a warmer tone and things like that. So obviously with lighting, I would anticipate, you know, fluorescence versus like an incandescent bulb, which are sure. kind of going by the wayside by way of LEDs these days. But sure. Uh, how, how does color and all that jazz, like, how, how do you do that? How do you design that? Well, aura? color is a, a big part of what we do. So whether it's the color of the space before we get there, so to speak, right? And this is all being done in plan form, right? There's no physical space usually when we're starting a project. So it's all starting from plans. Um, but understanding what the architect is doing or the interior designer, those colors, finishes, the reflectivity of those colors or finishes, are they shiny? Are they matte? All goes into the sort of first considerations that we do. And color, the color temperature of light, like you mentioned, the cool or the warmer reflectors are, are a big part of it. So the lighting in this room is actually dynamic. So I can push that button and we'll go from a, to a cooler light or to a warmer light. Um, and that's all made possible by LED. So shifting the color is, is easier now um, than it was back in the day. However, incandescent lighting, as, as we know, it actually does start off cooler at 100%. And as you dim it, it does get warmer. So we already sort of know it in our hearts and in, in our spirit, but we don't think about it necessarily. So I think that when um, LEDs sort of begin to replace incandescent, and I'm kind of going down a, a rabbit hole here, that people sort of realize, what, what's different? Aside from the color being a little bit different when it was new, like when fluorescent was new, people didn't respond to it as well. But over time, they go, you know what, it's different? It's like, I can't get it to dim very low or I can't get it to feel warm like fire or a candle like I used to when I used to dim my normal light bulbs. And so now over time, sort of the, there is now what we call warm dimming or dynamic white lighting, those kinds of things that allow us to get more of those um, atmospheres we're familiar with using those technologies. So like you can actually see there's two colors in this LED source up here on the ceiling. Oh, sure, side by side. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at a at an open detail that's not completed yet, but that's why you see all the individual pixels and you can see the warmer and cooler color LEDs. 
I'll have to post a photo on this on the Instagram yeah, when we sure. release the podcast. Yeah, it's but really uh, cool. But otherwise, it would look like this as a finish, right? Right. Looking at a photo. Sorry. So everybody. is that just? Well, sorry for those of you who aren't in the room. Uh, kind of a plexiglass. That is a stretch membrane in this case. So it's a seamless stretch membrane um, that acts as a diffuser for all so these individual fabric? pixels. It's actually a. It's not actually a fabric. It's a. It's a non-woven material. It's a membrane, effectively. Got it. Very cool. So something like that in this case, and that diffuses the, you know, mixes the color, all that sort of stuff. Sure. In this case, but sort of to go back to your original question, sorry for being so verbose, but um, no, that's what we're here for. Yeah. So so lighting is a funny thing, right? So people don't think about it until they realize that it's bad. If the lighting's good. It's like, oh, this space feels great. If the lighting's bad, you're like, oh, I hated being in that restaurant. It was too bright. It was too cool. It was, you know, whatever it was. And I think those are the places where people sort of first sort of see or feel that or, or have those sort of uh, reactions. So all those sort of things are a part of it. And then I think that to, to go into lighting from architecture or other forms of design is a little bit of, um, you have to be a little bit of a nerd. I think you have to like technical stuff. And then you also, you know, have to like the art of it because there's a huge art component to it. And then there's a bit of a science component to it. And, and I like it because I like gadgets and gizmos yeah and so sure. like you yeah. know an actual light fixture as an individual thing to play with is interesting what it does how it performs is interesting how it works with a group of light fixtures or as a whole scene in a room and then how you play with the dimming controls and things to create atmosphere i think is really interesting right yeah sure that's cool so what's the split like uh commercial versus residential because you do both so what does that split look like? I would say that about half of our projects are residential projects. Oh, really? Yeah. And they're, you know, they're, they're significant residential projects, you know, it sort of sounds whatever to say about it, but you know, it's like I did my parents' house, but it w we wouldn't probably be hired to do a house like that by anybody normally because it's a small house and budgets and things of that nature. So we're really a specialty consultant when it comes down to it. So when you think about the, types of projects that we're usually involved with on the commercial side we were talking about so hotels atmosphere sales retail sales brand identity those kinds of things so those are sort of the places where people know they win with lighting lighting is a huge part of the cake batter when you're making a hotel or retail store those kinds of things sure houses at a certain level recognize that's a huge part of it too and with the way the lighting has changed in the last five or 10 years, the way the energy codes have changed for all types of projects actually has, has made what we do become more important in the scheme of things. Now, has that made it more difficult or easier? Well, it makes it more challenging. I think you know, when I first started 20 whatever years ago doing this, you know, it was sort of, you know, it was just art. It didn't really matter how much wattage you used everything was incandescent or fluorescent as long as it felt good right and then later on or there was energy codes but nobody enforced them and they were really lenient by comparison but now it's like you know to be in this office space we get you know three quarters of a watt per square foot to light this space whereas in a retail store you might get three watts a square foot oh wow but 10 years ago you might have gotten you know one and a half watts per square foot for the office space and up to five, six, seven watts per square foot in the retail space, depending on where you were in the country. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, so so you, you have to sort of fit the design into the series of criteria. And um, that's one of the sort of more technical challenges. Um, and there's like, you know, daylight response and all these sort of things here in California. So as it gets, you know, more sun comes into the room, we have a sensor, it says, oh, turn down these lights over here. Right. Um, like an auto dimming mirror exactly, in your car. Exactly like that. Right. Um, and that's all you know, for energy conservation at this point. But the light sources we have today are much more efficient than they were back then. You know, like I can do with, you know, nine or 10 watts. So I could do a 75 watts, you know, 10 years ago or something. So, um, so that's been a huge push forward. I think in the beginning with the LED stuff, it was tough because the technology wasn't really ready, but we were sort of being forced to use it. So we had things like flicker, you know, where sort of like you could you sort of oscillate the room was kind of moving yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, or you actually do visually see some strobing. The color temperature wasn't great. The dimming performance was bad. 
but now that's all sort of standardized to some extent, not literally standardized. There are no standards yet. Right. But yeah, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting there. It's becoming fun to be a lighting designer again. I think there was a time when the toolbox got so limited that it was kind of, uh, right. It's just kind of stifling. Yeah. But I think we're, we're in a good place again today. It's still limited, but it's, um, but it's okay. So do you have, um, not really a preference, but is there something, what is the difference between residential and commercial? Like if you're just talking about selling real estate, a lot of people talk about how selling real estate from a residential perspective is fun because it's so much more emotion and, and you're, you're, you're selling a home totally as opposed to commercial, which is just, you're arguing deal. over price per square foot. So in lighting, how does that change the approach? Do you, do you prefer one over the other? Cause so many commercial spaces are also becoming more residential feeling, especially in the retail space. Sure. I mean, I think it's, that's true of, 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 of so much stuff. I think that, um, I like residential because I like relationships and I like to, to sort of see how we can inform or change the way someone lives, how they enjoy their time at home, their space. Um, and so you have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the clients and that's really, um, an important thing. You know, it's like you get hugs and thank you notes and these kinds of things that are really meaningful, um, on the personal level, whereas the commercial projects can be great. And we've done a lot of beautiful stores and hotels and office projects. Um, but you know, the thanks is usually a paycheck. You know, you get your check whenever you get your check and all that kind of stuff. And so you don't really have that same one-on-one -on -one thing. But I love them all. I love all the projects. It's not, I mean, right. it's so hard to pick. It's like picking your favorite kid yeah, yeah. at a certain level. This week's episode is brought to you by Passion Fine Jewelry, located in Solana Beach, California, where owners Jana and Tim Jackson welcome you into their living room-like store, carrying a wide range of independent watches and a variety of fine jewelry. Tim is GIA certified, and they also have a goldsmith in-house as part of their staff. Visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information, and if you're ever in Southern California, please make it a point to visit the store. You can also find a wealth of information via Tim's blog, independentintime.com. This episode is also brought to you by Standard H. Standard-H.com is where you will find all of our episodes posted, as well as some branded merchandise for those with Drive. Enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 20% off your entire purchase. Now back to the conversation. So what, what kind of inspiration do you get these days? Like what, like maybe historically, probably in school, right? When you were learning a lot of things. I would imagine they would just say, here, check these guys out and kind of not force feed you, but like what, what today inspires you? Like, what do you, where do you go to, to draw that? Hmm. I guess in school, there always was sort of this sort of idea that these are the masters of whatever it may be, whether it was art right. or architecture or whatever you're studying. Exactly. And so you look at those things and then I, I guess me being me, I've always kind of wanted to look further. Um, and so I've always had a look around and I, I think the masters are amazing. I love the masters, um, for all that, that they are. Um, but I also like the sense of discovery of, of finding your own thing. And it's hard to pick out any one thing, I think, because there's, there's so much and it's kind of like this week, I love this. And right. you know, last week I loved that. And it all just kind of goes into this big, um, hopper of things. And you sort of pull that inspiration when you need it. So sort of a beautiful thing, I think, with what we do is that, you know, unlike an architect or interior designer who works on a couple of projects at a time and they're focused on it day in and day out, we have a lot of projects in our office, about 100 projects. And so no kidding. And it's because we don't work on them for long durations of time. You know, it's like you work on this project for a week, you issue something, it gets put away, people have to review it, da 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 da, da comes back a month later, you do some more work on it. So you're always shell gaming all these things. But what's sort of amazing is that we work with all these incredible architects and interior designers and you're, you know, it's that fly on the wall kind of thing again. It's like to spend an hour or two in a room with some master architect and hear their the way they see things. Interesting. Take that in. Right. Find a way to apply it to another project. So the amount of influence that comes in here is oftentimes like you know, it's a series of source imagery. It's like Instagram, right? You're like, oh, you're just like, you're always looking for what's the next thing to be inspired by. At least that's sure. how I look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's all these sort of constant images, visual things. 
and then you know to that approach and so art architecture design fashion vintage cars whatever it may be those are the things i guess that i'm always looking at and nature you know surfing is an incredibly important thing and and being out there and color of the sky all these sort of things sort of inform these ideas as you sit here at the table coming up with ideas about projects and and what the spirit of them is but i mean there's so much amazing history in in the design world that is just still just being barely scratched at the surface i think i'm always learning something new it's really incredible that's um, I, i can't imagine how gratifying that must feel too because i mean so many people can sit at their job every day and they're just literally learning nothing they're just oh a cog in the in the process right so it's interesting i mean that's why i like i like i love lighting so much is because i i do feel like that advancement is so much faster the trajectory is so much quicker here um if you had that appetite you know for for more or faster or add whatever it may be sure. you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you're always in the mix doing something and you're always learning so much um that's that's cool So obviously architecture was going to have an innate role within the the lighting realm. How often does that work opposite? Like does the architecture ever change based on the lighting that you present and say, "Well, this wall is just not allowing for this natural light to come through the you know, the skylight or what have you." Oh, totally. I mean, I think that's the that's the spirit of what we do is collaboration. And so, you know, we can be in a meeting and say, "Hey, you know, what if you did this? This would help to do this. This would achieve whatever it may be or help hinder look at it this way, talk about it that way." So, I think, you know, if I, if there wasn't some level of, you know, that's the thing is like when you look at a building, there's this idea of authorship, right? So, it's like, "Oh, this is a John Pawson building. It's fantastic." And he and his firm are amazing but there's also like a bunch of other people that are involved in that project who don't have billing I'll say and this is not about John Poston in particular sure. I don't even no, know the man understood, understood. but um <laughs> but it's like so there's all these people that are actually a part of 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 shaping and creating all those places and spaces and um you know I think we are we are one of those voices in that process and so yeah definitely um you know the more collaborative we can be the the more successful we think the project is um it's not to say we want to take over somebody else's job at all that's not the case i just think that there is um at a certain level lighting for us is like you're a visual consultant you have to take all that information in from all those people and visualize it in a way that maybe somebody else isn't and then be able to sort of pick and choose the things you want to see or how you want to lead the eye or or someone through a space um with light and then there's different ways to do that and and is the light hidden is the light visible how do you, you know contrast layers movement all those sort of things come come from that and and so a lot of the collaboration with architects or interior designers is you know about how do you hide things or how do you make it feel like it's part of the space so it's not you know we talk about the idea that you know some people frost the cake we want to be in the batter. We don't want you to know that we were there. We want it to feel like it was all done by one hand. Right. There is that master behind it, whatever it may be. That's cool. So that's Are the, you a big Pawson fan? Cuz now that I'm looking at your office, it kind of I could see maybe a touch of of influence perhaps, uh maybe. especially in the the famous corridor. Maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe, maybe. color palette wise. Is that, is that a Pawson thing? Maybe. Well, sure. I think it's it's neutral and it's quiet. It's all those kinds of things. Yeah. You know, there's big ideas that don't feel overwhelming. So I think that's maybe Pawson like. We worked with a firm um on this project called Standard Architecture, uh not Standard H. Right. But um and great they were, name, and they were really great. Yeah, they <laughs> had it figured out. So no, so, so we worked with them and and they were amazing and I think you know we shared a vision together and I think in that collaborative spirit hopefully we each pushed each other to make something better than what a benefit was just one or the other on the project. Sure. Yeah. That's our hope I think every time out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um symbio, you know, symbiosis right. as far as that's it's like concerned. dancing. Yeah. yeah. Dancing well, and that's yourself. funny you said that because when you were talking about like architecture changing light and vice versa or when we were talking about that, it does ego ever enter the picture because if if you're trying to battle with an architect on something, 
do they, do you get much pushback? Like, no, man, I designed this on purpose. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you suggesting that architects have egos? No, well, I'm suggesting everybody has an ego. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there certainly is. And, and you have to know when you can push and when you can't push, I guess. And, you know, the more you have a relationship with somebody, the more you can do that. And I think, you know, fortunately here, I would say that at least half the work that we do in our office, probably more, probably like 80% actually is our projects where we're working with the same architect again, or the same interior designer. Yeah. And, and that's a good thing so sure. that you don't have to try and do that dance and sort of learn how you work together. And, um, it's okay. But you know, there, there are people who, who want input, input, people who don't want input and you just got to find your, find the lane and how you can support the project the best you can, whatever the scenario is. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so what, I doubt there's a typical answer, but like, what's a typical day like for you? Um, a typical day is meetings. I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of time spent working with our team and, and shredding with our team to sort of come up with ideas and concepts. That's the most fun. And then there's sort of the day to day managing of those projects and managing of the actual business part of it. Unfortunately, that's a reality. Um, so those are, that's that's pretty pretty much the the, the gist of it. It's sure. you know sitting with people and 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 sketching and drawing and you know like there's all kinds of doodles that you can see here that are just quick ideas about how you might hide something in a jewelry case or how you might express something more architecturally in a room, um, whatever that may be. Um, and I also like to work by myself a little bit. I like to sort of sit at my desk and play some music and 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 draw and just sort of think. Um, I think drawing by hand, you're really exploring things and the computer has become a big part of the design world and it's a great tool for visualizing. It's a great tool for production, but I think I can run through ideas so quickly with a pen and a paper or a pencil for that matter in ways that the computer can't give you that response. The computer sort of forces a certain level of precision right? that, um, you know, I can do like 10 sketches in the time you could do one on the computer and then the computer, you're like, ah, oh, the proportion, it's like, it doesn't matter. That's not what you're talking about. Right. Right. So, so I still love drawing by hand. So when we were in my office a little bit ago, I have a drawing, I have an old school drawing table. I can't, I don't do cat. I don't know how it's I funny. Want to, it's don't. funny. You're mentioning music too, because I was going to ask you about that. Like if music plays a part in kind of your process, is there any go to music that you listen to or is it just kind of like whatever you're feeling that day? You know, I, I wish I felt closer to the music thing. Um, I guess after after CDs kind of died, I haven't been as good with the digital music. It's sort of like, it's the same thing with, you know, the cut sheets and things in our world. It's like, I like to flip through a catalog. I like to see and, and make choices. So to just sit down and go like, oh, I think I want to listen to Lil Wayne today. It's kind of hard. Right. You know, unless you're really feeling Lil Wayne or, or whatever it a may be. A particular track or yeah. something. Yeah. And so like I look at Spotify and I just like stare at it and I get lost. But if I had like my pile of CDs, you know, I could look at that library and go, oh yeah, I could listen to pick a thing. Yeah, sure. But that's kind of the vein. I like energy and music. I also like to chill. It just depends, you know, it sort of depends on the mood and that's the beauty of music. You know, it's, it has a similar emotional power that, that lighting can have. And I maybe that's part of why I, I respond to it so much. Well, it's interesting you were talking about the sketching too. Like I, I play drums and so a lot of people prefer like a live drummer versus like a synthesized drum or something that sounds perfect, mm -hmm. right? So like the imperfect strike of a hi-hat is kind of synonymous with what you're saying from a sketching standpoint. Oh, completely. I think, you know, that's, and, that, and, in, and in music, it could be like microseconds, right? The, yeah, the difference in exactly. the feel between something so syncopated versus something that has a little bit more um, oomph in it, I guess. You know, like every tap isn't exactly the same. There's a little bit more restraint. There's a little bit more force depending on what is going on, right? Because as a musician, you're very much like lighting, right? You're responding to what the guitar is doing or what the keyboard is doing, what the yeah. singer is doing, whatever's happening. So you, it's, it's, it is part of a, being in a, in a concert in that way. And I think that's a really good analogy from a lighting standpoint um, and an emotion standpoint. Sure. Um, not to go back too much on like the inspiration thing, but I know you travel constantly or what seems to be constant. It's very often. 
it's more than I like. It's not like <laughs> travel for vacation or travel for surfing or right. fun. It's, sure, yeah, sure. it's work, right? What, um, I mean, obviously site visits and things like that. Um, like what are some of the projects you're working on right now? Oh, can you talk a, about them? Yeah, I can okay. talk about a lot of them. Um, you know, it's, it's such a mix. You know, I think, like I said, half of our projects are residential, and, and those are usually the more high-touch projects that in the retail projects that need, you know, really a hands-on situation. So travel for those primarily. And so for retail, it's pretty much, you name a big city, we've been there. Um, I just came back from, I was in Hong Kong and Taiwan last week. And then from there, I went to New Orleans straight away for a hotel project. So it's just sort of, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, I was in Taiwan for 48 hours. I was in Hong Kong for like 16 hours. I was in New Orleans for like 24 hours. Um, so it's not like, oh, cool, you can go to Jazz Fest or whatever's happening in those places. You're kind of, you're in and you're out. Um, and I always want to stay longer or try and find the right. weekend. But then I also want to get back and see my wife and hang out and it's funny you're like answering my questions without even asking because i was going to ask like how much time do you have in these places to experience whether it be food or you know like jazz fest like an event something like that sure i mean no i would, I would all those things sound amazing they're getting ready for the big jazz <laughs> thing in new orleans it's like oh if we were here maybe we'll go back in two weeks oh, i can't go there in two weeks i have to be somewhere else or get something else done so it's, it's funny, work, as much as I love it, is also, you know, it's this, this anchor in a way. And so you're, you're tied to it and you have to be certain places and schedules are not your own. You know, you're following that design schedule, that construction schedule. And so you find yourself having to be on opposite ends of the world within a day of each other and then home. Right. So it just happens. That's yeah. That balance, right? Like it, it just reminds me of the old thing. Like when you're enjoying a surf and the guy next to you is like, Oh, well you should have been here yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, well, thanks. I'm trying to enjoy myself today. Right. Um, that's, that's funny. What, um, what's the structure of the company right now? Like how many employees do you have? What, what does that look like? Uh, we have 12 people and then we sort of run the, um, the studio in three teams. So we have a, a series of collaborators from senior to junior people that are responsible for a series of projects, um, kind of by specialty almost, not 100% by specialty, but pretty close. It's like if a big giant project comes in, we have you know the team that handles those basically in a really high touch, usually go to another team, right? one, or, one of two teams for that stuff. So it just depends. That's cool. Golden State Warriors? Happening now. The new, do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Can talk about it a little bit, sure. We're doing the new arena for the, the Golden State Warriors basketball team up in um, San Francisco. So they're moving from the East Bay to San Francisco on the Bay. Um, Which is just unbelievable to think about. It's pretty wild. It's not, a, it's not a project that is usually something I would say, hey, let's do an arena. This is our first of its type. We're doing um, the facade and the site, the plaza. We're not doing the interior. I see. Um, but so it's still a, it's a, it's a pretty dynamic project. It's pretty interesting. I think you'll see here soon. We can't share photos of what we've seen so far as far as the lighting tests and things, but it's, it's pretty interesting and, and should be great. We're there next week to have a, a closer look as construction wraps up. So, you know, basketball, um, I think the first game is in October and the first show is in September is Metallica in the arena. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Nice. Maybe we should go to that. I don't know. Yeah. Well, give me a ring. I'll, I'll go up there. All right, let's do it. <laughs> um, you were recently featured in Architectural Digest for the Montana, or was that like a year ago? That was about a year ago, I guess. That was that one is El Decor, I think. Um, the Architectural right. Digest one is, is my wife's work in, That's right. in our place in New York, yeah. Now, what makes those places special, the one in Montana through El Decor and, say, this space? In, did you work on the lighting at all for your place in New York at all? No. Nope. That was just no, all interior? That was, that was all, all before me. Most of that's before me. And I think you know, the approach to lighting there is, is not really about lighting, per se. It's a lot about lamps and decorative fixtures, sure. you know, conventional dimmers, all those sort of things. So... We work on some projects like that, but it, you know, it was all sort of all the construction was done before we met years ago. Gotcha. So what makes the Montana house special? The Mon Montana house is special. Um, it, you know, it was new construction. It's, um, it doesn't mean anything, I suppose, but it's, um, you know, it's got a great architect and a great interior designer, my friend, Sean Henderson, who actually 
sort of our matchmaker actually performed our, our wedding ceremony for Juniper and I. Oh, no kidding. Um, so he was the interior designer there. Um, and then, you know, it was just, it's a, it's a beautiful home. I think, you know, the, the shelter magazines are really interested in, in, in beauty. I'm interested in beauty. Um, you know, the lighting is off in all of those photos, of course, so you can't actually see our work too much. Um, but it's always nice when your when your projects are acknowledged by by the media and press. Sure. So, um, going back to the beginning, how we met, you were the first person to shop on the Standard Age website that I did not personally know. Oh, was that right? Yeah. Um, and then subsequently, you and I became friendly, which yeah. is just kind of fun and cool. Um, so I think I was customer number nine. I think I remember when I got oh, the you, packing yeah. slip. I was like nine. Wow, That's because I only have eight new. friends. Oh. <laughs> well, you're doing better than me then. <laughs> um, so outside of that, let's talk cars for a minute. Sure. What are you currently driving? What do you? What inspires you? What have you driven? What do you want to drive? Oh my goodness, cars are such a, a, a interesting subject. Um, I'm currently driving a 2001 Jeep. Cherokee, which is the last production year of the sort of the boxy Cherokee. Um, and it's a really fun car. It's not the kind of car you want to take on a really long road trip or anything. Um, but it's fun. It kind of brings you back to my childhood. It's good for surfing, things of that nature. Um, although it's really small inside. Like you think back, it's a truck, yeah. it's a, it's a SUV, but it's literally, it's four feet wide inside door to door. So I put like a four foot light fixture sample in the back. It closes door to door. <laughs> you found out the hard way. I did. <laughs> And when I bought it, I really bought it as a car, a car I could take surfing. And then I realized, you know, quickly that, you know, I ride very small, I guess, surfboards, five foot eight or whatever. And it's like, wow, it kind of barely fits in there too. It goes between the seats, you know, so it's not that, you can't put it in diagonally. So um, it was good intentions and it's a beautiful car and, and it's low miles and all those kinds of things. So I, I, I love that. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, like, I like cars. It's hard. Um, when my wife and I first met before we were married and she was living in New York, I bought her, um, like kind of on a whim, like straight away, like before we had confirmed that there was magic and chemistry as like, <laughs> I'm like, I found this 1971 Mercedes 250 C and I was like, and I was kind of into that car for a minute. I was like, ah, oh, this is, maybe this is affordable. I should buy this car. Maybe she'll come to LA and spend more time here if she has a car because this is kind of before Uber sort of maybe. And she would like do the zip car thing in New York. And so she got a zip car here once. And I was like, ah, oh, maybe this will encourage her to come and spend more time here with me. And that's a bold move, man. <laughs> yeah. Kinda, you bought her a was. car. <laughs> I bought her a car. You know, it wasn't an expensive car. It was, you know, it was, you're still buying a car, right? So I guess cars are expensive. For all but, you single guys out there, then you might, might want to take notes on this one. Hey, it worked well for me. <laughs> and she loves the car. It's not perfect. You know, it's, it, was, it was, you know, kind of not even really a driver when we bought it. And then spent a lot of time kind of getting it drivable um, and reliable. All the things that you want for your loved one to take around. Safe, reliable, drivable. Sure. So it's... You know, next up is upholstery for that car just to make it feel like an everyday driver car. Um, so we have that. And then, you know, like we have a daily driver Audi. That, you know, it's really my wife's car and I have the Jeep and, and that's it. But, you know, I kind of, you know, I, I, I hurt my leg recently and so I haven't been driving. And so I've had like the itch for a car really badly. And so I'm like looking around and it's like, oh, my friend Josh has this beautiful Porsche. I'm like, oh, I have maybe get a Porsche. And then I'm like, oh... You know, I just, I just get a Grand Cherokee. It's kind of like my car, but reliable. Sure. You know? And then I'm like, yeah, but I don't know. And then you're like, what's it mean to drive a fill in the blank? And you look around on the streets and, you know, cars aren't as interesting as they used to be. They've all kind of become sneakers. A hundred percent. And so then you like, look at like, it's like, you know, I've always wanted a Mercedes wagon, like an AMG wagon, but I just don't want to be the guy with the. Mercedes. So why wagon. not like the RS4 Avant? Uh, that would be amazing if that car still existed. I mean, <laughs> right, they don't, sure. it's not in current production, right? Although I right. did hear that the S6 Avant is coming back to the States. I believe I read the same thing. So that that's good that you heard it too then, because that's a very interesting car to me. I sort of love the sort of Audi is sort of an understated luxury car. Um, although it's getting a little less understated, I think, as, as we sit here and look at the new cars driving by. Um, and then it's a wagon, so it has all those sorts of things. The know. utility. Yeah. 
And it doesn't shout, like, look at me so much. I mean, I guess if you went all the way with wheels and all that kind of stuff, you could. Right, sure. But then I also, like, you know, recently someone showed me on, like, Bring a Trailer, there was, like, you know, an, an old, like, a 1979 AMG conversion uh, wagon. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, at auction. And I'm sure it was going to be like a hundred thousand dollar car. You know, you can't lease that, so that's Br- not really an option. <laughs> it's brutal too to and take then, care of. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, thought about that. I mean, just taking care of the Mercedes we have has been tough enough to find the right person who gets it and is, you know, cares about it the way that we care about it, not just like change the battery or something. Right. Um, but uh, then my my architect friend who worked with us on this project sent me a um, another like a, a late '80s. AMG conversion that was from, I don't know, it was Japan or something recently. And I was like, oh, this looks really interesting. And showed it to some friends. And they're like, I don't know if it's legit, you know, because it came from overseas. And Got it. You know, maybe it's not worth the money. It's maybe worth half of that. But you never know until you see it. But the car is not in L.A. And I'm not flying anywhere to go look at a car. I, I don't have that time, you know. But it's like always interesting, you know. So I'm always looking and I'm always inspired by you know that sort of design and and you know whether it's the seats or the steering wheel or the shifter in those old cars i have a whole folder of car stuff on my phone of interesting vintage car door panels or whatever it is that might find its way into inspiration for a project i have no clue yeah i was gonna say like what was the last thing car related that maybe worked its way into your repertoire um i'd have to yeah it's a good question i don't know if i have a specific answer to say like oh this like, do you handle. pay attention to the actual lighting in the car? Not, not the daylight coming through the window or the, the moonroof or what have you, but the actual lighting itself, like the LEDs or, or the... Sure. So, like, we're shopping for a new car for my wife because her lease is up. And they're like, oh, you can get the lighting package that changes colors. I'm like, yeah, we don't really want that. A Virgin America flight. <laughs> Which is actually a, a nice thing for a flight. I just don't need it in the car, you know. Um, Maybe someday I'll change my mind, but right now I feel like I just need to see what I need to see, and I'm in the car to do what I need to do, and, and go. I'm not trying to get a, a back massage. Or well, maybe mood en- mood enhancing light, I guess maybe. It helps you deal with traffic if, if, here. You know, on that the four hundred five. You know, something sure. that like calming lighting. Sure, sure. <laughs> Take it. Um, well, let's talk surfing. Sure. When so I guess you grew up surfing. You grew up the beach, right? I did. I grew up near the beach, not at the beach. Um, you know, we used to take the bus to go to the beach, and we were just talking with my parents about that the other day. About they send you out the door, seventy-five cents to get back home. So you carry the seventy-five cents in your hand to take the bus to the beach. Then in your little key pocket in your wetsuit or whatever it is, you put the other seventy-five cents. And if you're lucky, you had a dollar to get some warm tortillas at the local chicken shop or no something way. to eat before you went home. Yeah, no, seriously, that's awesome. So it's like, I can't imagine parents today doing that kind of a thing. Right. But that's how it was growing up. Um, so you, you dragged your board onto the bus. Yeah. Wow. And then you'd get back on the bus wet and come home and leave a puddle on the bus. If they were okay with that. I feel like the bus drivers these days would probably just kick you off the bus. I would think, you know, as a kid, you're just like, I'm here, I'm doing it. And you don't think about it. But right. You recognize you leave a puddle and some sandy footprints or something. Um, yeah, like I'm 11. I don't know any better. Kind of. Here's like your that. 75 cents. <laughs> and they were, like I said, they were okay with it. And then you would, you know, in the afternoon, you would like take the bus the other way and go skateboarding somewhere. That's awesome. Um, but no, the beach was an amazing thing, and surfing's great. I learned to surf pretty young. Um, my brother surfed, and so that was, so I guess, probably the inspiration for it. And I think you know, I found a surfboard in the trash or something and fixed it, and then went to the beach with my friend Glenn across the street, and then you know. So we learned to surf on our own in this little area called Crabs in Seal Beach, which is by the river. Cool. It's not really a surf spot per se, but you know, after they blackball the pier, that's where you get to surf. And as a kid, you don't know. You just go to the beach, and that's where you're allowed to surf. And you, you learn, and you go. And then just from there, right. that was it. Surfed competitively a little bit as a kid. That's cool. Had big dreams, but you know. Sure. There's reality. And, um, you know, as I sort of came and went from surfing a bit through my my young adult years i think during college i didn't surf very much um wanted to but didn't and then moved away and tried to surf in san francisco but admittedly you know 50 degree water water isn't isn't fun ice cream headaches every time you duck dive is not super inspiring and it's 
murky. You can't. It's it's kind of freaky out there. Yeah. I have to admit. So the guys in the gray suits swimming beneath you. Yeah, there, there's that. Um, I've only had that experience here in Huntington Beach. I haven't had that uh, up north, but there was definitely like the fear of it. And I had a, a close encounter with a sea lion up there. Okay. Um, that spooked me. Um, you had a shark moment down here though. Oh yeah. Like when I was like 17, 18, what was that like? What happened? Uh, just really quickly. Um, so I was, my friend Darren and I were surfing at like Brooker street, I want to say. And it was just he and I, and it was like mid morning Waves are pretty small, and we went out being cocky kids. We went out with you know no leashes and goofing around and kind of normal stuff really at the time. And um, so we're out tooling around and you know catch a wave, lose a board, go swim for it into the deep part, you know whatever. Right. And I'm paddling back out, and for whatever reason, the water's pretty clear, unusually so, and I can see the bottom. And so I I saw my shadow on the on the sand floor below, and it kind of spooked me. And the water's like four or five feet deep, you know, paddling. And it's like, oh, oh, it's just me. <laughs> but it's shaped like a shark, right? It's pointy and long and narrow. So I'm paddling a little bit more, and I, then I look to my left, and I get spooked again. I'm like, oh, my shadow again. Oh, wait. It's in a my different left direction this time than <laughs> yeah. my right, and I know the sun is over here, and I'm like this. Uh, oh, and then I see the tail, and I'm like, oh fuck! So this little nothing wave comes at me, and I decide the best thing to do to get away from the shark is take this little dumb wave that's coming at me. Yeah. So I paddle for it, I catch it, stand up, do some dumb turn, fall, and lose my board, all the way to the deep section, and I'm like, oh my god! And so I but there's nothing to do but paddle or swim, right? So right, I, sure. I go swimming for it. I get it. And I'm like, oh, cool. Well, I'm sure he's gone. I'm just gonna go surf. Paddling back out. Sure enough, there he is again. He's underneath me. And so I decide to stop paddling because I'm a little panicked. I don't know what to do. And I put my feet up on the board like this Indian style kind of thing. And then he starts to circle. He's like six feet long. And he's like, you know, a huge shark, but that's enough to that's, like yeah. have a foot or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Or an arm. Yeah. And that's so then all of a sudden, um, he darts off towards my friend, Darren. And I'm like, shit, yeah, what do you do? I'm sorry. And, um, and so I'm like, I yell over to Darren, who's like 40 or 50 feet away. And I'm like, Darren. He's like, what? And I'm like, shark. He's like, shut up. And then all of a sudden he's like, shark. And then we paddled in and that was kind of the end of it. Um, and then, you know, fast forward 20 something years later, like there's been all these, you know, shark sightings down there and, you know, people being bumped and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's always in the back of your head when you're in nature, I guess, in the, in the sea, because you can't see them. They can see you theoretically or sense you anyway. Um, but you just don't know. And I think, I think back to like being on the seal beach, you know, surfing the seal beach pier and seeing like blue sharks being reeled in on the pier. And you're like, Oh, that's just the one he's gone, whatever. And you know, blue sharks are, are different as predators than great white sharks, right? Great white sharks. Once they're on their trajectory, there's no stopping them, you know? Right. So that's the thing I think that when you realize, Oh, you know, these are great white sharks, that's a little scarier than just some other shark you could like yeah. scare away. Right. Yeah. So they're like full tilt. Oh, that's crazy. Kind of scary. Well, um, I know you're a watch fan as well. Uh, a little bit. So you've got, what, what are you wearing today? This is a 1964 Rolex. I can't read it. I forget. Date just, I believe. Yeah. It's, it a, looks simple, like a, date it's a simple date just. Yeah. Was like was like the know. dome bezel with the yeah. oyster bracelet. It's a riveted bla- bracelet, actually. Oh, and the dial is kind of a cool color. It's like... Yeah, sort of monochrome. It's yeah. sort of like all stainless-ish in color. I don't know what the... Yeah, I mean, like, I like it. I don't know all the, the details and specs. I did have a different crystal at one point. I didn't love the bubble. The bubble's actually plastic, I think, on this watch, if I recall. Oh, right. And then um, because of the age of it, and then I had a glass crystal for a while, and then I went to have it repaired, and they put... Because uh, it wasn't keeping time, and they replaced the crystal back to the original idea right with the cyclops window yeah i kind of i kind of didn't even notice it for like a month i said oh wait because the watch had been in repair for so long like why is the date bigger (laughs) (laughs) it's a funny thing you kind of kind of of can't really read the date unless you look like straight on it anyway 
That's I have this. I have a, um, I have a, a sort of contemporary Rolex with a black face, um, still the small case. And then I have, um, I mentioned earlier, that 70s Seiko driving watch that I couldn't muster to find this morning that I wanted well, to share with you. Well, you'll have to shoot me a photo of it. I will, for sure. When you find it. Um, your living quarters currently, can we talk about sure. where, you, where you live a little bit? Sure. You're in a really interesting house. Yeah, we're, we're, we're renting um, an early Frank Gehry duplex in Venice Beach um, known as a Spiller House. And it's sort of the most interesting time of the, the Frank Gehry architecture to me. Um, there's, uh, this, is a, this is a house I actually admired when I was in school and I lived down here, you know, 25, 30, whatever it is, years ago. Oh, that's crazy. Um, and then a friend was actually renting it and they needed to move and then they contacted us and we were looking for a place and so we just sort of dovetailed right into it and it's been um, really cool. I think um, there's a lot to learn in that house, as simple as it appears from the street. I think it's, mis- it's misleading. You know, it's exposed two by fours. It's wrapped in corrugated metal. The windows go over the two by fours. Um, and then the way the, the drywall is used sort of sparingly is, is like a wrapper. The whole house is about sort of bones and skin, the different skin on the outside and different skin on the inside. Um, but it's sort of interesting to see the way he was thinking about all of these things because it's not at all the way... Um, you look at construction on a on a typical house or a typical building for that matter. So there's another project um, by Gary around the same time called Gemini G E L. They're actually an art producer. They make um, lithographs and they're on Melrose here in Los Angeles. And I always loved that building in school too. And it's the same sort of thing. It's a there's sort of two different containers that are the building, not like a shipping container that that's really popular now. But this is right. like one is a a stucco box. And the other is a, a wooden box, a plywood box. And then there's um, a glass connection between the two. But all the windows, again, have you know, the two by fours run through the windows. The glass is applied on the outside over the two by fours. So it's that idea, but again, about the skin and the skeleton of the building. And then he's just beginning to play with geometry. So it's in the, in the earlier works, you know, geometry wasn't as much of a thing as it became. Right. And now it's become much more sort of loose, freeform curves, these kinds of things. And so, so it's fun. It's, um, so was that know, the inspiration, like an exoskeleton sort of as well with the, with the windows being over the two by fours or I wonder, was there anything in particular that was the inspiration behind the house? Do you know? I think in your Frank Gehry podcast, you'll have to ask him. Yeah, I guess I'll have but, to ask Frank. But I, I think it, <laughs> it, it seems very clear that there is an idea about, um, you know, a skeleton. And then there's, there's these two different skins, sort of the interior skin and the exterior skin um, that are clearly just cladding. You know what I mean? So as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about it, that, you know, the only place where the, you know, the, the two by fours go through the windows, like, like, you know, across where the window bays are. And the only place where they aren't is where there's doors where you have to walk through. Right. So um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we, cool. Live in, we live in the, the smaller, the front unit, and the owner unit in the back is bigger and has, is much more experimental. I think that's because maybe ours was the rental unit in the front. It's a little bit more conservative, but I think it's really interesting. And in the back, he's playing with geometries and pulling and stretching forms more, uh, but with a lot of the same ideologies that we have in our front unit. Um, Although, while well, that's really cool and probably more identifiable as, as Gary, I think the, the front house is actually sort of a little more interesting to me. That's cool. That's awesome. Well, um, just back to the business real quick. Like, what's sure. been sort of the hardest thing as over the last 21 years since you've started your business? What, what is, what's been the most difficult? Well, it's, it's hard to have any sort of one answer. You know, I think the, the design, design work is, is fun. You know, it's, things have changed. You know, I started, I was drawing by hand. You know, we did hand drafting, and now it's computers. It was CAD. Now it's building information modeling. So, like, you know, there's always these sort of big leaps in technology. Um, so I think that's a part of it. I mean, you're looking at a rendering there. It's actually that's the lighting model for that particular project. Um, showing the intensities on, on that. Um, so that's sort of something newer. I mean, that itself isn't newer, but the 
you know, from when I started, some things you have to adapt to, and then just running a business. Right. You know, at a certain point, it is a business, and you have to make sure that you're not just designing because you love it. I mean, that's a that's why I, I'm doing this and not working on cars. Probably, I love cars too, but I don't know. Um, but I think that it's um, you know it's a business, and you know there's 12 people out there that count on on me at the end of the day for a paycheck to take care of their families, and so it's equally important that the business is whole um, as a business. And you know I'm I'm still learning all of that um, all this time later because I didn't I didn't set out to have a business. You know I was lucky that um, someone trusted me to do some work. And I was lucky to get paid to do it because I loved it. Sure. And it just sort of evolved. And so I'm always constantly trying to figure out how to keep ahead. Yeah, that's awesome. So then what would you say is the easiest part? Just the actual design? Well, maybe. I think the the design stuff comes easy. I think it's sort of, we talk about it a little bit here that it's, and I got this quote from from other people, so this is not my quote at all. Um, but you know, it's ten percent inspiration and ninety percent perspiration. So the ideas come pretty quick. Then implementing them takes some amount of time, and then executing them takes even more time. And the sort of collaborative nature of construction, which is what we're in. You know, there's so many different parties and so many different people to coordinate with to sort of ensure the outcome at the end of the day um, that it's it's a lot of work. So that's the 90% part of it. That's sort of the least fun for me anymore. Um, but if I get out there and it, it is me doing it, then I actually have fun with it. It's just all the competing interests anymore. It's like, you know, oh, you have to be in this meeting. I oh, have to go see this thing and check on that. And so if time were an issue, I would love to do all of it. Sure. Because I still love all of it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. What uh, advice would you give anybody, any students in architecture school that maybe not be thinking about lighting per se? They're like, oh, wow, well, that's actually kind of a cool facet of this whole thing. Did I pay you for this? I don't know. Um, lighting lighting is an interesting thing. I think you bought a hat, in all fairness. So, okay. Or two. Two. You bought two hats. I guess two. Yeah. Um, and subsequently, I don't remember. <laughs> but I think, you know, the thing about, about it is, is that... Lighting is an interesting um, and really creative way to be expressive within architecture. And as we mentioned earlier, you, know, you get to work with so many amazing architects and interior designers because lighting is a, is a pretty select thing. It, it really is only at the top you know, like 1% of projects or something that get lighting consultants. So you kind of already ensure yourself that you're working with the best in, in the business, best in the area that you might be in, depending on where you live. Um, and what your reach may be. Uh, so I think that's really interesting and inspiring and you learn a lot. And like I mentioned, the trajectory is so much faster. The learning curve is so much faster here. And then I also think that it has the potential to be much more lucrative than an architecture position. So I think that you could um, achieve a lot in a much shorter timeline doing lighting design than you, you might be uh, in the typical architecture office where you sort of go through all the different things. You know, I think at this point I've done over a thousand projects or I've been involved in over a thousand projects. That's um, crazy. And, um, you know, I think if I were in architecture still today, I'd be like, oh, I've done 15, 20, right. maybe, depending on what kind of projects they are. Um, and that's also the thing, too, is we have this big mix. You know, we don't have a, a signature per se. We have a, um, a, an approach. But I think that if you look at all the work, it sort of we're chameleons. And so when we work with pick an architect or pick an interior designer, you can't necessarily say that, oh, I can see that the same person did the lighting for all of them because we're responding to them. And, and that's part of the fun is to sort of figure out how to how to be that chameleon, how to be part of the cake batter, not the frosting and, right. and so on. So I, I think, you know, lighting is interesting. There's certainly not enough people doing it. You know, the demand for lighting because of the codes and all of those sort of things has gone up quite a bit and there just you know there aren't enough people to fill those those positions wow so do you have interns and like things like that like do you we have do. kind of a mentorship type of we do we have um we do internships we have a, a full-time employee now who was once an intern here a couple of years ago very um, cool and so yeah we're always looking for people who are passionate about design in all facets you know i think years ago 
because lighting is still kind of a new thing as, as a independent design discipline that, you know, it's like, oh, this person's from fashion, this person's from product design, this person's from the theater, right. this person was in architecture, and you sort of take all these sort of things and you bring in all these amazing range of knowledge and experience, life experiences, and put them together to get whatever it is that, that we um, create or achieve, and that's been interesting, but there are, you know, like three lighting programs in the U.S.? There's not much. No way. And so, so where know, can you go to learn more about that? Or like, what are the three? Do you know? Um, sure. There's, um, there might be four, five. There's, um, Rensselaer Polytechnic in New York. There's Parsons School of Design in New York. There is a program at Kansas State. Um, Pennsylvania State University is sort of the one that's maybe most known. We actually have three Penn Staters here in our office. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing one. TCU used to have a program. It's gone um, with the retirement of the person that led that. And the others that have something to do with lighting teach a, a course. There's not actually a degree program. Got it. Um, and even the ones that are degree programs are sort of like you're in architectural engineering with an emphasis in lighting. So you're right. not necessarily just getting schooled on lighting full time. Um, we made an effort to get a master's degree program off the ground here in Los Angeles, kind of a grow your own um, sort of idea here in our own backyard because all those schools are all somewhere else. Oh, I miss Colorado Boulder. Colorado Boulder has a Boulder. program too. Boulder, yeah, sure. See you. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's it though. And so we tried to get one here locally so we could kind of grow our own in this community. It's like New York is the other big design community and so they kind of have their own with Parsons and RPI. Yeah. Um, but it just didn't get off the ground. But that's we're hoping cool. to give it a go again. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, man, this has been a ton of fun. I hope and so. It's, and it's always good to see so. you. Yeah, likewise. Need to need to get in the water sometime soon. Um, really appreciate you taking the time, yeah, man. man. Thank and you. Thanks for the tour of the new space. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to share it. Cool. All right. I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Wesley. Cheers. All right. Take care. I'd like to thank Sean one more time for having me in his new office. It's architecturally really, really cool. So check out architects like John Possum, who was, who was mentioned. Um, his office, to me anyway, feels very much like uh, a version of a John Possum building um, who's designed things such as retail spaces for the likes of Calvin Klein, for example. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank you for listening and really appreciate you rating and subscribing to the podcast. If you haven't already, it really does make a difference. Uh, again, um, visit standard H.com to further support the podcast by way of picking up some merch. And, uh, as always music provided by Jensen Reed and super beautiful until next week. Really appreciate you listening.